consciousness, my private inner awareness, my personal subjective sensations. Nothing's more ordinary, nothing's more mysterious. Mind stuff seems so different from brain stuff. I did my doctorate in brain research. I know how correlations work, matching what happens in the mind with what happens in the brain. And yet, still I wonder whether consciousness is something more. Many believe that consciousness exists independent of brain, apart from the material world. And from this kind of consciousness, some infer the existence of God. Can one argue for God from consciousness? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Here's the religious argument. Since consciousness was created by God, we can use consciousness to reason back to God. In other words, because we know consciousness exists, we can conclude God exists. In testing this argument, I'll give religious philosophers the opening statement. Whereas I, an old brain scientist, would tend to believe no such thing. I start at the Talbert School of Theology in Los Angeles with Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland. I don't often agree with J.P., he doesn't mind. But in defending traditional religious ideas, his arguments are clever and coherent. JP, how would you rate the argument from consciousness as one of the demonstrations of God? Consciousness is basically what you're aware of when you introspect. Uh, it is a realm of feelings and sensations, emotions, thoughts, beliefs, desires, those sorts of things. And you cannot describe conscious states using the language of physical science. All you can do is correlate them. Now here's the problem. If you start the universe with a Big Bang and all you have is matter, and the history of the universe is a history of the laws of chemistry and physics taking chunks of matter and rearranging them into increasingly larger, more complicated chunks of matter according to physical chemical law, you're not going to get consciousness squirting into existence because that's to get something from nothing. It can be put simply by saying if you start with matter without mind, you're going to end up with more complicated chunks of matter, but you won't get mind coming into existence. And so you have to start the universe with consciousness itself being fundamental. Now, that doesn't get you to God yet, because there are two worldviews that are still on the table. One would be that uh, what's kind of called panpsychism, that a fundamental feature of matter is that it also is conscious, which is not a, a purely scientific view of matter now, or there is a conscious being. And my argument that there is a conscious being as the best explanation for our consciousness would go as follows. You never find a case of consciousness existing without it belonging to a subject. If the universe begins with consciousness, therefore, that consciousness must belong to a unified I or a subject. Uh, uh, the the counter-argument would be to try to cite one example of where you have conscious states floating freely without them belonging to a self. And I can't think of any examples of that. I would say there are some religious views, uh, perhaps Buddhism or aspects of Hinduism, in which the nature of consciousness would, would not be in the two categories that you suggest. I think a third category would be that consciousness is more than matter, but not a person. It is some sort of a, a, a realm of existence, which is pure consciousness. Well, you're quite right. 
and indeed some forms of Buddhism actually don't believe in, in a self, a, a, a anatta, the doctrine of no yes, self. There's right. no enduring I. Now, for a lot of reasons, I, I would claim I know that I'm an enduring I. I'm aware of myself continuing through That's time. That's your problem, they would well, say. Well, there's my problem. There you have it. I've got to get rid of that idea. Well, who's the one getting rid of it? But me, of course. And you can state that consciousness exists in some third realm if you want to, but I'd like to know your evidence for it. Now, you are using the same kind of argument against the material who would say that how can you have consciousness without a body? The only examples we know of consciousness are beings that have bodies and brains. Now, you, you dispute that argument. But now you're using the same argument to dispute those who would say that there is this cosmic consciousness. No, I don't think it's the same argument. There's a difference. Uh, the connection between consciousness and matter is, I think, pretty clearly contingent. What that means is you could have one without the other, and conversely, the connection, though true, doesn't have to be true. I think that's obvious from just considering uh, what matter is and what consciousness is. And I think once you understand the nature of consciousness itself, you discover that consciousness is a certain kind of thing, namely that it always belongs to a subject. And that is part of the very nature of conscious states themselves, that they are ownered, not ownerless. And so the most rational explanation for the existence of fundamental consciousness is a fundamental subject that has it. Whom you call God. Yes. It's no revelation that J.P. believes that consciousness leads to God. He argues that we have no case of consciousness without a subject or a self. Come on, J.P., we also have no case of consciousness without a brain. Pardon my scientific skepticism, but God sure doesn't jump out at me. A self could be an artificial construct, not really real. Just as consciousness could be a synthetic fabrication, our brains tricking us. So JP's argument for God falls off a cliff. This would not make me happy. I want to believe. Okay, I'm ready to spin the question in the opposite direction. How would an atheistic philosopher attack the claim that consciousness leads to God. I go to Oxford, England, to meet Bede Rundle. People often think that this is the, the last great problem to solve, what is the nature of consciousness. And it appears to them as a problem because they implicitly take consciousness to be like some kind of stuff, but, but not this core cool stuff that our arms and legs are made of, some more ethereal, subtle substance. And the question is, how does that substance relate to the brain, say, and the physical more generally? But I think it's worth looking at the term consciousness in the category of different kinds of noun. And here you say, well, it's an abstract noun. It's like kindness, for example, or carelessness. And you note with them that when you use one of them, you could equally use just the adjective. So if you say uh, her kindness was overwhelming, you can equally say she was overwhelmingly kind. It's just a stylistic variant. And you wouldn't think of kindness as some kind of stuff. Now, take consciousness. To lose consciousness is just to cease to be conscious. That's not some stuff that's suddenly vanished. Well, what is it? Well, it's in the same category of terms such as being aware, being attentive, being alert. And whether or not a creature is conscious, going through that range of things, it's pretty easy to determine. So you know that the lion chasing you is conscious. For Unfortunately, he shows his awareness of his environment by modifying what he does in the pursuit of you. You didn't have to speculate about some strange substance or some strange anything going on in mind or brain. That's by way of indicating that it is a natural phenomenon. That it's easy to make more of a problem than there is if you think of consciousness as some kind of stuff with a location. What you've got to do is to try and spell out in greater detail and then ask yourself, well, does this make any demands on anything outside 
the natural world. And I just don't see that it does. Can you now take the consciousness that you're describing and infer from that that there exists a God, an ultimate consciousness that created that? Is that a legitimate inference? I don't think you can draw that inference any more than you could draw it from other human traits. It just seems to me that uh, we stay within the animal kingdom when we're talking about consciousness. And do we have any right to ascribe consciousness to a being who does not have any senses, for example? What's he conscious of? And so there are difficulties with the extrapolation. And in any event, no need for it as far as I can see. To be... Consciousness is the culprit, not the clue. Consciousness causes problems, he says, not solves them. Bede has no need for anything outside of the physical world, much less for a god. It's a rational argument. I hope it's fantasy, but I fear it's fact. That's why I seek a leading philosopher of religion for whom consciousness is critical and God does exist. Oxford Professor Emeritus, Richard Swinburne. Richard, you take the existence of consciousness, which is greatly debatable in today's world, but from that, you have an inference to the existence of God. Yes, let's be clear about the datum first. Um, Physics deals with the public world, um, public world of tables and chairs, which it explains in terms of the unobservable public world of atoms and molecules. Uh, but uh, as well as these things in the world, there are thoughts and feelings and purposes and desires and beliefs, and these are the world of consciousness. These are quite different from the goings on in the brain which cause them. Of course, if I feel pain, it's caused by something happening in my brain. But it's a distinct event from what's happening in my brain. Why do I say that? Well, uh, suppose some creature arrives from Mars looking a bit like us and it has a central nervous system. So we cut it open and we find in there all sorts of connections between neurons. And uh, so we learn all about its physical nature. But we'd still wonder, does it feel anything if I stick a needle into it? Does it feel anything? And of course, we wouldn't know the answer if it was made slightly differently from us. And that's because um, it's one thing to say what's happening to the neurons, electronic connections. And it's quite a different thing to say what they are connected with in the world of consciousness. And mere knowledge of the one doesn't give you knowledge of the other. And this is the world of consciousness. And the next question is, uh, well, are these just sort of properties of my brain? or is there something more to be said about them? I think there is something more to be said about them. That is to say, I think they are properties of me who are an immaterial thing. That, uh, that the essential me is a soul to whom the purposes, thoughts, feelings and so on belong, which is in interaction with my body. So the datum from which I'm starting my argument is that there is a life of thought and feeling which belongs to an immaterial soul in connection with the body. Now, how do you go from that to the existence of a supreme being? Well, as in all these arguments, the existence of God, um, the phenomena is good evidence for the existence of God if it's such as you would expect if there is a God and you wouldn't expect if there isn't a God. If there is a God, his reason for creating us is going to be connected with our mental life. He's interested in creating beings who have purposes, thoughts, intentions, and uh, can interact with each other and uh, with God himself. He has no particular interest in creating robots, so, so you'd expect this. Uh, if there isn't a God, um, would you expect this? Well, not from, uh, not a priori, and not nearly from the, all the laws that govern the physical world. It would have to be something extra, because the laws that govern the physical world tell us how energy is exchanged between bodies, how um, charge is conserved, how one fundamental particle gives rise to another. All these are public and physical things. They're not concerned with the production of consciousness. But, you may say, 
Why shouldn't the science of the future incorporate these things? The very way science has developed suggests that it can't deal with consciousness, but if there is a God, you would expect it. So that's reason to suppose there's God. Richard's argument flows like this. One, consciousness is certain. Two, the properties of consciousness cannot be explained by the properties of brains. Three, a soul is needed to explain consciousness. And four, a soul is evidence for God because souls would be expected if there were a God and would not be expected if there were no God. But each of Richard's four points are contested. One, some philosophers dismiss consciousness as artificial. Two, most scientists assert that the brain can explain consciousness. Three, some theologians eschew souls. And four, some faiths have souls but no God. My convictions swing wildly between the exhilaration of belief and the disappointment of non-belief. Perhaps I can refute an atheist better than I can trust a believer. So I go see the happily aggressive atheist, philosopher Quentin Smith. Quentin, one of the arguments for the existence of God takes as the premise is the existence of consciousness. And from that infers the existence of a higher state of consciousness that people will call God. Well, the very premises of that argument are taken from empirical observations done by sciences and also in everyday life. And there's never been encountered a case of a consciousness that does not have a brain or a body. And so they're trying to explain the consciousness that's dependent on our brain in terms of a consciousness that has no brain, no body, or anything. And so th that, that conclusion contradicts the premises because its premises are about consciousness that exists on the basis of brains. Certainly there is no example, the, the other example that theists can point to, but they would say that that's no proof that th the other doesn't exist. The old story, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. You can't exclude that. Um, I think you can, uh, because in every case of consciousness that's been examined, humans, hi higher mammals, and even down lower, in every single case, consciousness has been based on the brain and they've identified the parts of the brain that give rise to it. And so that is a causal necessity, or a law, a necessary law of nature. But then the argument would be that because consciousness seems so unbelievably special, that is the justification to see a higher exemplification of that same kind of, of first-person awa internal awareness. I think consciousness is not nearly as special to warrant that type of uh, conclusion. Look at human consciousness. Human beings are psychologically immature, morally immature, we're not very intelligent. We don't learn from our mistakes. After thousands of years of existing, war is still going on. Uh, so our consciousness, uh, I would think, is something we should be ashamed of, if anything. Well, I, I, I don't think any of that contradicts the point that I'm making. Uh, the, the, the core point of consciousness, it may cause all these terrible things you're talking about, but there's this internal experience that really cannot be explained by the physical world. Well, most people, maybe all people, are self-deluded. They believe they are somebody that they really are not. Well, look at all 10,000 different cultures that have existed and all those different first-person perspectives and self-images. They're, they're all different. And so the likely conclusion is this first-person perspective is diluted. I think human consciousness is far more similar to the consciousness of chimpanzees and dolphins and whales than it is this idealized concept of this God. The jump from us to God is like uh, jumping from chimpanzees to, to, to God practically, given that we're not that 
much more intelligent than chimpanzees. And so I think our consciousness is genetically so inadequate that it couldn't possibly reflect an, a god who would create us with this astoundingly inadequate, immature, immoral, ignorant, unimprovable, probably more morally evil than morally good. I can't believe that a perfect being would create such things as humans. I mean, the main reason God doesn't exist is that humans exist. And that makes it self-evident that God doesn't exist. Quentin is so sure that God does not exist that any argument for God he repudiates and ridicules. I too despair for humanity. But human depravity does not undermine raw consciousness, which is just too strange not to pursue. But I cannot do what many believers can do. They assume God exists, then assume God created consciousness, then stress the specialness of consciousness, and then use consciousness to reason right back to God. Sound circular? Though I'd like the conclusion, I cannot countenance the argument. So I turn to philosopher Colin McGinn. Colin cannot explain consciousness, nor can anyone else he stresses. But in no way does he leap to God. I push him about the argument from consciousness to God. Colin, is this an argument that you think has any validity to give people a theistic hope? I don't think it gives them a theistic hope, but I think it's an interesting argument. It's interesting in the same way the argument from design was interesting before Darwin's theory. In the case of consciousness, it's similarly reasonable to say, well, we don't have an explanation of the origin of consciousness in material terms. We just don't know how it arose in evolution, and we don't know how it arises in an individual, in an individual's growth, you know, from embryo to, to child and so on. And so, since we lack an explanation, um, we then think, well, there must be something outside the material world that could explain this. It's not an unreasonable view, but there's a clear reply to it, which is logically analogous to the reply that Darwin made. Uh, Darwin could have said before he thought of the theory of evolution, well, but there's a theory which explains the existence of design, which doesn't postulate God. Yeah. We don't know what it is right, yet, right. but we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, right. And then two years later, he comes up with the theory. Right. Now, in the case of the argument from consciousness, we could say, well, just because we don't have a theory now to explain consciousness doesn't mean there couldn't be one or we couldn't discover one. So let's not rush to postulate God as the explanation. Indeed, you've pioneered and, and have uh, promulgated this view that there's something deeply mysterious about consciousness. Mm. Mm. So your uh, philosophical analysis have given many theists uh, reason to hope in their argument from, yeah. from consciousness. Yeah. What they're saying is because we don't have an explanation in naturalistic terms of consciousness, we must postulate a supernatural explanation. But why would we do that? Because we've got two possibilities. One is we might develop a, a naturalistic explanation of it in due course. Or if you're somebody like me, you might say, well, we'll never develop it, the naturalistic explanation. It doesn't follow from that, and it has a supernatural explanation. It doesn't follow from that, but it is consistent with it. It's entirely consistent with it advantage of those kinds of theories is they have no explanatory obligations because, for example, what's the mechanism whereby God produces consciousness? How does that happen? There's no answer to that question. It's meant to be a miracle. So it's the end of science. Where does God's consciousness come from anyway? The, the correct point is that there's an epistemological mystery about how consciousness arose in the course of evolution, which is another a fancy way of saying we're ignorant about it. <laughs> we don't know it, how it arose. But you should never interpret ignorance as the divine. It may well be that um, the um, onset of consciousness will always be something which is um, opaque to us. Our brains and our minds are not actually um, programmed to be able to encompass. And even if we never discover the real n cause of consciousness, that still would not be an argument for the existence of it a It would God. never be an argument that that cause was a supernatural cause. Any more, as I've made this point many times, any more than... I'm troubled by consciousness. I'd like consciousness to lead to God, but what I'd like bears no weight on what really is. I hear the arguments of smart believers, 
who start with God as premise and then find God's handiwork in the fabric of the cosmos, consciousness being a prime example. I respect that, but I myself do not have enough to start with God, so I cannot concur. I cannot proceed with that logic in that order, from God to consciousness and then reinforced back to God. No, not me. I must start with consciousness, not with God. And when I do, with all I know about the brain, I find a mystery. A mystery so deep that I doubt consciousness can ever be explained by today's physical world. So I twist the logic. If God exists or does not exist, either way, consciousness brings us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.